to quickly recap, <coughs> last week we talked about how the children of Israel are now out in the desert and they've had God provide for them and do miracles for them. They're becoming a nation. And he has given them a set of laws. It's actually just the first set of laws. We will go over the next several books in the Old Testament. And we're going to learn different laws that he sets into place. But he's given Moses a set of laws. Notice he does not go, God does not go to every individual person in the nation and say, Thou shalt not and thou shalt. He gave a leader the laws and he said use these laws to govern my people okay so it wasn't that uh, I get tickled sometimes when I hear people say well me and God we've got this worked out you know and, and we've got the, as long as I love him and, and we've got this special agreement going no you don't have a special agreement you have your own agreement and you're putting God in it and that's not really how it works um, because his law is the same for everybody there is no exception so We've looked at Israel's survival being completely and totally dependent on their obedience. Salvation is the same. If you're going to make it to heaven one day, it is reliant on your obedience. The love of God is worthless if you do not obey what he has said. If you love me, keep my commandments. Not if you love me, then that's great and that's all that matters. There's a condition. If, then keep my commandments. Um, so over the first few books of the Old Testament, there are roughly 613 laws. Thank God we don't have to know them all because a lot of them are subcategories. Um, some of them are moral laws. In the New Testament, when they try to trip Jesus up and they say, what are the greatest commandments? What are the greatest laws? What are the greatest things? You know, what should be done? Jesus made two statements. He said, first, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and mind soul, spirit, strength, everything you got because there's only one. There's only one God and you need to love him with everything yeah. you have. Do you realize that takes care of like the whole first half of the Ten Commandments? If you love God, then you're not going to build another image right. for him. You're not going to worship other gods. You know, you're, you're going to follow those. And the second commandment was love your neighbor as you love yourself in the same way that you love yourself. That takes care of the other commandments. Because if you love your neighbor, which is everybody, like you love yourself, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to kill them if you love them. Okay? So it's not, I really love you, but I don't want you to live here anymore, so let me knock you off this planet. It doesn't work like that. So those two greatest commandments kind of encompass everything else. It is the governing rule. So he gives moral laws and civil laws and ceremonial laws. Civil laws are don't steal. If you do, this is the punishment for that. That's how civil laws work. Ceremonial laws, wash your hands before you go worship Jesus. Don't come in with a snotty face. Don't eat chili in the camp when you can't get to the latrine, whatever, outside. So we have very clear instructions. Moses is giving this to the people, and it's very clear. If you obey me, I will protect you. Um, children, if you don't act like a brat and you obey your parents, you have a long, happy life. Or my rear end doesn't hurt when I obey my parent. It's not hard, people. It's not rocket science. Okay? And, and that's what God's telling his people. Do right, and we'll be in covenant. That's kind of how it works. If you don't act right and you decide to go do your own thing and you are completely oblivious to the laws of God, you will be cursed. What does that mean? You're separated from the blessings of God. You're separated from the favor of God. Now, anybody see a trip hold on that or, or something that might be a, a cause of question now in the New Testament covenant and in the modern day life? If you don't obey God, then you're cursed. Well, what about people who... I was going to say, <clears throat> one of the things that I've quoted before, and I can't remember who it was that said it, but uh, he said, the greatest calamity to the fallen man is to prosper in sin. And, you know, my father is a perfect example of that because he has uh, come to the conclusion that his financial blessings are all because he's okay. 
So that is one of the greatest tragedies is that people associate success from the world standards or wealth or whatever as the favor of God. And that's, that's extremely sad because that's not biblical. Now, in the Old Testament, their welfare did completely revolve around God's provision. Right. Unfortunately, and I say that sincerely, unfortunately, in today's society, you can still survive and succeed in this society without God. Yep. You can right. do it. Because the God of this world is centered toward wealth and success and power and fame and all of those things. And you can go to heaven without ever having any of them. So, when people say, well, I must be okay because God is blessing me in this and this and this. He has blessed my business. He has blessed my life. Look at this car I drive. I have God's favor. No, what you have is success. There's a difference. That, that's, doesn't that still kind of comply to an Old Testament principle that I think Jesus may have even mentioned it, if I'm not mistaken, but that the rain falls on the just and the unjust? Did Jesus say that? He did. It, it does rain That's on the just and the unjust, but the Testament thing is, right? who said rain had to be negative? Well, no, 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 no. It's positive. That's the point. But that, that's what it is, right? Right. It, so it, if it, you plant seeds, it doesn't matter if you're evil or if you're righteous. If you're planting seeds, it's going to rain on both of them. It's kind of like good, good things happen to good people and bad people, and bad things happen to good people and bad people. So you can't justify your walk with God based on the success or the failure of your finances on the in the, this society in this timeline. You cannot do it spiritually either based on whether or not you feel God's presence. That is a big concept. That means that God's presence and his spirit is not biased. If you call on the name of God, if you are really seeking to feel his presence, you can do that. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues and be lost. Because the Bible says that true worshipers will worship him in spirit, which is feeling the presence of God, maybe even being filled with the Holy Ghost. But they're going to be filled with spirit and in truth. You have to have those two things. If that were not the case, then when God said in the last days there will be people who will say, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. And he says, I don't even know you. That word know is a close relationship. It's like the intimacy of marriage. He's saying, I'm not connected to you. You use my name, you felt my power, but I'm not connected to you. So you cannot use the fact that you feel the presence of God as an okay meter. I'm going to go to heaven. I am okay because I have felt the presence of God. That means that we got to stay on top of things. There is some responsibility that we have to take to make sure that we are right. Um, so he put all of this stuff out for Moses, and he says, I need you to let them know that this is the covenant. If they obey me, then they will be blessed, and if they disobey me, they will be separated from my favor and from my blessing. And that's how that will work. Um, this does not take away from the love of God. God is still a God of love. And he is, even though he says, if you disobey me, you will be separated. That does not make him an unloving God. That makes him a holy God who will not inhabit an unholy life. Does that make sense? All right. So tonight we're going to look at Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. And we're going to look at the signing of the Mosaic Covenant. Mosaic Covenant. That's the covenant that God established with his people through Moses. We're going to read verses 1 through 3, and we're going to kind of break these verses down just a little bit as we go through them, and hopefully I won't be long tonight. I can deal with it. Verses 1 through 3. Moses relates all of the words of the Lord and all the judgments to Israel. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, for Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All these words which the Lord hath said we will do. So Moses is told to gather these certain people together. 
He didn't tell him just to go and pick some good people that look like they're responsible for stuff and come near the presence of God. He gave him specifics. He said, go and get Aaron, your brother, who will later be um, associated with the priest. Aaron's two oldest sons, Abihu and uh, Nadab. And then get 70 elders. 70 elders. And then come near. They are not allowed to go into the presence of God, but they're allowed to go toward it. Okay? There's still a very clear separation line here where only Moses can go up into the presence of God. But he's saying, you're not exclusive. I want the others to come and, and start working toward me. And so Moses came and he told all the people the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And so Moses is relaying information to these people. And then they respond. Now, have you ever told your child something and they're going, <laughs> or, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you'll look at them and say, what did I say? Uh, I kind of got that response a few weeks ago in Sunday school. I was like, okay, and this is, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're not going to do this, right? So what are some good choices we're going to make in Sunday school? And one precious little boy said, not do the bad stuff. <laughs> yeah, that one. And I said, well, what is the bad stuff? The stuff we're not supposed to do. I was like, I love you. You are just like the perfect example of all things church. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of, I feel like, where Moses was with the people. He was going, okay, very clearly, can you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? This is what God wants us to do. And they all respond with, everything you said, we will do it. <laughs> yes, we will, we will do it. That's kind of where they're at. And so Moses takes that covenant, and <laughs> he has now got a verbal agreement. Verbal. Now, remember, up until this point, we have verbal tradition, oral tradition. So everything that happened, whenever we hear about the, um, the covenant with Abraham, that's an oral tradition. That means it was told to so-and-so who told it to their son so-and-so who told it to their son so-and-so. And eventually it made it all down the, the line there. But now God has got a nation of people that he is establishing this covenant with. And just the, the verbal you said, she said, he said, ain't going to work anymore. Okay, It's not, not working quite like that. So now that Israel has verbally agreed to this covenant, Moses writes it down in a book. A book, like an all-out book. Or actually, it would have been a scroll. The Bible says book, but it would have been a scroll. So the covenant with God is so important that it cannot be left to human memory because it's fallible. Human memory is fallible. Do you know that the court of law will not take a personal eyewitness as a fact whenever, if you said, I saw that person rob this store and they were wearing this and this and this, that is not, it's admissible in a court of law, but it cannot determine the conviction of a person because memory is fallible. Your mind will fill in the pieces that you cannot remember. It doesn't matter if you're mentally stable or not. Right. It will fill in the missing places. And that's why you've got two people from the same family who can remember events completely different than they happen. Um, I can ask Ashton what's happened three weeks ago when such and such happens, and she can tell me what every person in that scene was wearing. I, for real, it is crazy. We were on our way to um, Muscle Shoals this weekend to um, preach for the Dolphins, and uh, she said, Mom, do you remember when we were going down this road, we were having this conversation about the Mormon religion, and you were wearing such and such and such and such and such and such. How many years ago was that? I don't, I, I don't remember this. But she can remember what we were wearing. She can't remember the details of the conversation. She can remember what we were wearing. Human memory is, is weird because we associate things. So in verses 4 through 8, he says, Moses wrote all of the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And then he set young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in a basin, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said unto or said we will do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of thy covenant, of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these, all these words. Now, a blood covenant. There's an Indian tradition that whenever a peace covenant or a peace treaty or whatever would happen, the Indians would cut the palm of their hand, not deep, but just enough to where it would bleed, and they would shake on it, and this would be a blood pack or a blood covenant, and it would mix the blood of the two people together. And the blood would be a sign of a covenant. And that is really cool in our history. Okay? But if you go back 4,000 years before that, 6,000 years before that, we see a time when God made a covenant with Abraham. And he said, I will bless your, your generation." people that come after you. I'm going to bless them, and you're going to inhabit this land, and this land, and this land. And you're going to be the father of a great nation. And this covenant is something that's going to last forever between you and me. And this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and I promise this, this is a covenant that's going to bind you to me. And Moses said, okay, but in order to sign that covenant, something had to happen. Blood had to be shed. If you look back at Genesis chapter 15 and 9, and he said unto him, and this was God saying unto Mo, uh, Abraham, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And God divided them all but the birds. And he laid them out, and he, as the presence of God, he went in between the sacrifice. And that blood that was shed signified the signing of the covenant that God was making with Abraham. It established it. So tonight, in Exodus chapter 24 and 5, we see um, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Covenants are only made in the context of sacrifice. Okay? Everybody with that. You cannot have a covenant without a blood sacrifice. That's going to be important here in a minute. I want to make sure that that, that clicks. Why a sacrifice? What happens when something is sacrificed? It dies. Why does something have to sacri be sacrificed? Okay. Why? Why does something have to die, though? Blood is shed. Okay, blood is shed. From Jesus died. On the cross. So there is a, a Hebrew tradition that says that when a family were to bring their offering to the Lord and sacrifice it, they would lay the animal on the offering or on the altar. And as the priest would sacrifice it and the blood would flow, the family member that was the head of the house would hold on to the horns of the altar or hold on to the animal being sacrificed and they would watch the eyes of the sacrifice as it bled out recognizing that the blood that was being drained from this animal was replacing their debt when a sacrifice happens it is us admitting or that person admitting their sin and their failing before God and addressing the need that they need a death for that substitute. That saying that what I've done, my life, my sins, my burdens, the things that I've done are so bad that something has to be paid. There has to be a penalty because God is holy and you cannot go into relationship with him when you have sin in your life. So a sacrifice has to be made as an atonement, as payment for your sin. Something has to die. Blood has to be shed. That's where the sacrifice comes in. So let, let me just kind of bring that home a little bit. When you're in 
the church service and, and you enjoy the presence of God and you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you speak in another language and you're just caught up in this heavenly experience, blood was shed for you to have that experience. Yeah. Right. Because you didn't deserve it. And I didn't deserve it because we were born in sin. But blood was shed on a cross so we could have that experience. That's where that sacrificial covenant came in. You're not your own, but you were bought with a price. And that price was on the, um, was paid with blood on Calvary. So let's look at that just for a second. Let's cross-reference. Okay, so we're going to take this verse where it just talked about blood being poured out, the sacrifice to sign the covenant that God has just made with his people, that he would protect them and be with them when they obey. Okay, we just talked about that in Exodus. Let's look at Matthew 26 and 27. This is Jesus sitting at the Last Supper with his disciples. And he's talking to them, and he's passed this cup around. And he says, Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You see, all the way up until then, every time a covenant happened between God, an animal had to die. But when Jesus sat at the table with his disciples, he said, there's going to be forgiveness of sins for anybody who asks for it. And my blood is good enough, pure enough, perfect enough that when my blood is shed, that covenant is signed. No longer will there need be sacrifices of animals because I'm about to sign this covenant with my own blood. That's awesome, guys. Yeah. That, that yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Luke 22 and 20, in that same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. No longer will an animal have to die. My blood is good enough, which is poured out for you. So he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the So he's taken everything that they verbally agreed on and he wrote it all in a book where God told them, we went over this a week or two ago, God told them don't make other idols. Don't When you go in and inhabit these lands, remember it's going to be at least a year before you go into the land because if you go in now, it's too big for you. You can't handle it. So I'm going to slowly drive them out. I'm going to send hornets out and you're going to inhabit this land and when you do, don't pick up their practices. Don't start worshiping their gods. Get rid of their idols. Don't let that be a snare to you. Um, stay separated. Stay holy. He read all of this back to the people. And they responded to it. You know, if this goes back to me and God have got this special agreement. God's covenant with his people in the wilderness was completely and totally based on his words and his terms. Nowhere in there did the people say, okay, well, let's negotiate this agreement. Um, we will agree to this as long as you let us do this. Or, you know, God, let's have this special agreement, and I want to feel your presence, but I also want to go out and do. Never did that happen. Right. Never. Because God is holy. He's pretty smart, too. You know, he's kind of all-knowing. And he knows where we will fall. And he knows what will hurt us. And he knows what we should stay away from. So the covenant was based on his words, his terms. It's still based on his words and his terms. Right. And not ours. Not our ideas. Not our own, um, I don't know what the word is, negotiations maybe. An interpretation is a good one. That's huge. Well, I just don't think the Bible would. The problem is we just don't think. <laughs> it doesn't really matter because it's, it comes down to what does the Bible say? Right. Well, I just don't think a loving God would send people to hell. Well, he doesn't. That's why he died on the cross. If somebody goes to hell, it is completely and totally their choice. Absolutely their choice. God's not sending them to hell. They're sending themselves because he died on the cross to keep that from happening. That's right. He also loved us enough to give us our own free will. We make those decisions. Um, so don't don't let a refrigerator magnet decide for you what the Word of God says. Read it for yourself. That's important. It doesn't matter what we feel like God should be. It's very clearly in His Word what He is. Um, and He is holy, and He is just, and He is loving, and He is kind, but He is just, and that He is holy. And all of those things go 
together in completion. Did you have a thought on that? You like your hands? No, I mean you were, you were talking about the refrigerator magnet, and I just kind of made a quip about it. And, and Facebook memes too. Facebook memes. And there's yes. lots of people, and, and it may be humorous, but there are people that I know that have based theology on Facebook memes, and they'll, and they'll come around. But I thought the Bible said. And I'm like basing history on the history channel. Oh, that makes my right eye twitch. <laughs> because we all know that the history channel is not history, it's entertainment. Um, well, I say we all know nice, that, but, but a lot of people don't right. know that. Right. So, a perfect example of this is I have a friend who posted a scene from a movie. And the, I wish I could think of what the movie was. I've never seen it, so of course I googled it. And he starts out quoting this verse that says something along the lines of, um, you've messed with my family and now I'm going to go in and annihilate your family and no one will be left standing and blah, 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 blah. And then it puts a scripture at the bottom of it. Um, what, is, what was that called? It was like, it was a classic movie from like the 90s. And um, I think it had Samuel L. Jackson in it. Anyway, I'll get it to you later. And I thought, what in the world? And somebody responded to it, and they're like, oh, yeah, most people don't know that that's even in the Bible. I'm like, yeah, pretty sure it's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, obviously I go and look up the reference. And the very first line of what he says is absolutely in Isaiah. It's just like, you've come against my family as the destroyer, blah, 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 blah. And, um... I forgot what, anyway, the, the whole concept was crazy. And so I started reading it, and then it just, like, it's a Psalms or a Proverbs, and then it just kind of flips over to this other stuff, but God will be my refuge and my strength, and, you know, typical Psalms and Proverbs stuff. And I'm like, where is the rest of this stuff that's quoted on this, what in the world? I mean, it's, the Bible doesn't say that. And I realized then that it's a quote from a movie. And he starts quoting scripture and then adds his own stuff in the language that is King James Version style. And so it looks like he's t continuing to quote scripture. And most people won't stop to research that. And by research it, I mean open your Bible and look at it. I mean. Well, Abraham Lincoln once wrote to Ulysses S. Grant at the end of the Civil War not to believe everything you read on the internet. Absolutely. Abraham Lincoln also made a couple of tweets about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a knee slapper right there. Um, My millennial self is not laughing. <laughs> the millennials did not find that funny. So, <laughs> oh, so anyway, um, you have to be careful to understand. But one of the, the biggest downfalls when it comes to people misinterpreting scripture or trying to make scripture say what they want it to say mm -hmm. is that they're reading it as literature and they're not getting to know the author. When you know the author, the verse means different things. It will speak to your heart because it's alive. And that's, that's one of those things. You cannot look at something uh, as it stands alone. Um, I sure wish I could find that. Anyway, I will. All right. So he tells them uh, all of the law, and they agree to it again. Um, whenever you read God's word or you hear God's <clears throat> word, there should always be a response. There should always be a response. Let me tell you something else. Whenever you hear the word of God preach, there should always be a response. Mm -hmm. That's why there are times when pastor preaches that if you've never received the Holy Ghost for the first time, the altar is open, and tonight is your night, today is your day, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost, and pastor's wife's in the altar. <laughs> yes, I've been filled with the Holy Ghost, but there's something for me up here. It doesn't matter if that sermon was directly for me or not. I need to be in the presence of God. There is always something for you at the altar, whether that sermon was lined out with your name on it, whatever. Right. 
the last thing I need to be doing is sitting back in the pew chilling and, and eating Cheerios and following my nails and clipping toenails. I'm going to be up here worshiping God because there may be something that I don't even realize that he wants to do in my life that happens up here. Yeah. 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 So, moving right on. Yeah, that, that, it's good stuff. And hallelujah anyhow. <laughs> um, so there's always got to be a response to God's word. And um, it had to be freely. So Moses did not force the people to say, I agree to this. Right. He did not force them to sign on a dotted line. He gave the word of God to them, and they freely said, I, um, I agree, we will do this. Um, okay, so that's where that came in. All right. Now, Moses took the blood. And he sprinkled it on the people. Now, in our society, that seems so grotesque and so nasty just to think about. First of all, you've got thousands of people out in the wilderness. And a whole lot of offerings have just been offered up. A whole lot of, of people, I mean, a lot of things have died. And there's a whole lot of blood. Today, when you understand that Christ died for you, and you go to him in repentance, and you're baptized in the name of Jesus, and you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you are applying the blood of his sacrifice right. to your life. Yeah. But in the Old Testament, Jesus had not come to earth yet. He had not died on a cross yet. So there were other substitutions. That's why there were sacrifices in that time. <coughs> They had to have a tangible thing that represented them applying that sacrifice to them. Okay? So when Moses took the blood and he put part of it in a basin and he put some of it on the, the altars and then he sprinkled it on the people, think about that. They walked away seeing something on their skin. They couldn't walk away from this experience where they had just said, God, I'll obey you. Anything you say, I will do it. And that covenant, that contract is signed in blood. They couldn't do that without walking away and seeing blood splattered on their children. Mm -hmm. It was a reminder that they had just signed a covenant, that they were in covenant with God. And it wasn't just them. It was their household. It was their children. It was their grandparents. It was their mother-in-law. It was everybody was in covenant with this God. The nation received that blood as a covenant, and it was sealed. Mm -hmm. So when we apply the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice to our life, we join that covenant. That's why we say things like, I plead the blood. Have you ever wondered why we say that? It's because we are reminding the situation. We are reminding ourselves and the enemy, and even we're reminding God that we have applied the blood of his sacrifice to our life. That price has already been paid. That's and right. there are certain benefits and blessings and favor that come with being in covenant with him through his blood. Yeah. So when I say, listen, my children are sick, but by his stripes we are healed, and I plead the blood over that situation, I am claiming the blood that has been sacrificed for me and for my healing and for my salvation and for my family. I'm claiming that power and associating that with the need. It's not a gory thing. It is a, a place of power. It's spiritual authority. I'm baptized in Jesus' name. I'm in covenant with his name. He died for me. I have accepted and I know that that blood was shed for me. I'm going to apply it to this need. Yeah. That's right. We're stating that the blood of that sacrifice has been given and we're claiming the blessings that are associated with it. Yeah. There's nothing magical about that blood. But because it represents the life of a being. Because I think it's um, Leviticus says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood represents the outpouring of life. The life being given for another. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could live eternally. He said this when he said, In my blood is the new covenant. Through that new covenant, we have the hope of glory. We have that hope of salvation. Because he shed his blood. 
So the elders and the priests of Israel were with God on Sinai. Um, it says that, and then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as if it were a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. This is kind of a, a deep scripture. I don't have time to go into it a whole, whole lot here, but we're going to kind of cover really quick. It's really difficult to say exactly what the elders and all saw. because They didn't go all the way up into the presence of God. They were still afar. Right. But they were, okay, a mountain's a big thing. Yeah. Okay? And we know that the, the average people were not allowed to even touch the mountain. That's why God had Moses build a fence or a wall. He built a wall. Yeah. But he had the elders and he had Aaron and Nadab and Abihu come up, but not all the way up until the very top, not into the presence of God, but where they could see the presence. As far as they were concerned, they were seeing as good as it gets. Look, there's God up there. I see him. The clouds are open. There's this beautiful blue uh, sapphire, whatever, stones, and there's all this stuff, and it's coming from the throne of God. This is the Holy of Holies. We see it. But did they? Um, maybe they saw a vision of God. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and then it says, but on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. This is kind of indicating something. That as glorious as this experience was, as wonderful as it was, there was something that was missing in the encounter. They felt the chill bumps. They heard the thunder. They had a woohoo moment. But they were not in the presence. We have to be so careful not to be satisfied with your bones. Because the presence of God is powerful. And I, I think sometimes, even as seasoned Christians, we feel that, whoo and we go all Pillsbury Doughboy and just kind of, we're happy with that. But that Pillsbury Doughboy experience, is not going to carry you when you walk out and the gates of hell meet you face to face. Right. Yeah. There is something that happens in a daily walk with God and a prayer life when you're in your living room and you're praising God and speaking in tongues. That's different than feeling chill bumps when you're in a good service or when the music is just right or beating or whatever. You cannot live for God on a Sunday service only relationship. That's right. You cannot. Cannot. That's right. You've got to have a constant and consistent thing. And you've got to be able to know the difference. You need to be able to understand when you just got Holy Ghost chill bumps and when you're walking in relationship. God's called us to walk in relationship and not just have Holy Ghost chill bumps. <sighs> okay. So, my, my dog taught me that. That's, that's what he does. So, they saw something. They had the chill bumps, but they did not have a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Uh, the elders could see God, but there was no fellowship. There was no communion with him. It wasn't just them and God. But then they ate and they drank um, in his presence because he wanted them to communicate a sense of fellowship with his leaders. He wanted them to know that he's there. He wanted them to know that this was real, but it still wasn't one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. So Moses goes to the mountain to meet God and to receive the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Okay, This is our last verse. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there. That by itself could preach. Don't just come into the presence of God, but be present when you get there. Yeah, it would preach, I promise. Because yep. how many times have we come into the presence of God, but our minds are six legs? Oh, yeah. yep. That's true. Right at the right. end, you know, or whatever. Joe's gone to six legs. Or we've come to the presence of God, and yes, we're here, but are we? You know, you're not all here and you're not all there either. You're just kind of floating in that midweek. I don't really know. He said, go there. And pretty much he said, chill out, wait. Just be in my presence for a little bit. Be present. He said, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua. 
And Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. And then Moses went back into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, notice on the six days, that's just like creation, but on the seventh day, God communed. Um, and on the seventh day, he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And so Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. A whole lot of stuff can happen in 40 days and 40 nights. You know, it can rain and destroy the whole earth. Um, children can act a fool and tear up the whole covenant with God. You know, it's all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah, we're going to cover some of that in a little bit. But um, Moses went up into the presence of God, but he took somebody with him. And I love this. I never noticed how present Joshua was in the early days of the wilderness until I started studying this. Because Joshua was not a leader yet. Joshua was a young person who was willing to be used. He was an assistant. And while he was being an assistant, he was learning to lead without knowing it. He wasn't in special leadership training classes. He was available. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes our greatest ministry is availability. Yes. Yep, that's right. That's true. So he went up. This is the same Joshua that's going to become this great leader. It's going to march around the walls of Jericho and who's going to lead the people into the promised land. But right now he's a youth. Yeah. And he's carrying stuff. And he's stacking chairs. Mm -hmm. And he's cleaning floors and he's making peanut brittle. Okay, so I may have slipped that into the, this century. But that's what Joshua's doing. He's being a servant. He's doing what needs to be done. He's carrying armor or whatever. He's helping Moses in battle. Remember a few weeks ago when we talked about there was going to be a battle and Joshua was like, okay, here I am. What you want me to do? Okay, sure. Yeah, let's go beat him. I don't quite know what I'm doing, but yep, we're going to do that. And he did. Because he was willing. But right now he's just assisting in the spiritual thing. Um, and then he says, indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. Anybody remember who Aaron and Hur are, where they fit into the storyline? Aaron's the brother. He's his brother. And Hur, the, uh... He could have been a brother-in-law. Could have been, um, the, the thought is that he might have been Miriam's husband. Um, or he could have been a, who, who was it? It was like a nephew or something along those lines. That's what I was trying to say. But, hmm? Charles. Charles. say he's the brother of Ben. Yeah, he's the brother of Ben, Ben Hur. Ha, ha. Pastor's got jokes. Um, leaving aside the spirit of stand-up comedy. <laughs> if you'll remember when Moses goes up onto the mountain while Joshua's fighting, he lifts his arms up, and whenever his arms go down, the enemy wins. And whenever they go back up, then the Israelites win. Mm -hmm. And so Aaron and Ur come in, and they they prop his arms up. If I'm not mistaken, Aaron was in that, but I know Ur, Ur was. Anyway, so that's the area where they've already assisted Moses. These were the two right-hand, left-hand men. So they should have been capable of taking care of the camp while Moses was gone. They should have. They did not do an excellent job of that. They failed. And we're going to learn how next week. Um, yeah, they messed up. Um, can I just put in a plug that not everybody who looks like an excellent leader is an excellent leader? Amen. That's right. Just because they look like they've got everything under control and they look like they should be handled, sometimes they're just full of hot air. And they really don't know what they're doing. That's why God sets up the leadership. And sometimes he puts people in charge that you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Um, these two should have been capable. They should have, but they were not. Um, and then the last uh, part of this, it says, The sight of the glory of the Lord was an all-consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. An all-consuming
all-consuming fire all throughout the Old Testament God's presence is likened into a fire you've got the fire in the, the burning bush with Moses and then you've got the fire on the mountain the fire that leads them through, through the desert the fire that um, the Shekinah glory was like a fire cloud that would come down and then you know, whenever the day of Pentecost came, and all of the 120, which it doesn't say, just for the record, doesn't say that there were only 120 on the mountainside when Jesus said, go back and linger and tarry in Jerusalem. It doesn't say how many people started out in that upper room. Think about that. Jesus had multitudes following him. He could have had 500 people on the side of that mountain when he ascended into heaven, and he said, go back to Jerusalem and tarry. But when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were only 120 left. Yeah. Not everybody that starts out on this race is going to finish. Mm -hmm. So 120 are in this room, and they're praising God, and they're all in the same mind, and they're worshiping God. And all of a sudden, a wind sweeps through the place, and it set on them like cloven tongues, like as of fire. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you the same fire that came down and just kind of hovered in that place and filled everyone with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak in another language. It's the same fire that hovered over Mount Sinai mm -hmm. two, four year, thousand years ago, before that. That's the same presence of God. Yeah. That yeah. same fire is the same fire that hovered in the bush in the, on the side of the mountain, that same mountain, and spoke with Moses. And that same fire is the fire that you feel when you come into the presence of God and you start worshiping Him. Mm -hmm. If we ever grasp that it hasn't changed, it's not a history lesson. When you go into the presence of God, you walk into the Shekinah glory. It's the yeah. same God and the same presence. That's right. If we ever got a, a clear understanding of that, it would change our lives. Yeah. It would change our lives. The glorious presence of God lingered for 40 days while Moses was on this mountain. 40 days without a pastor. 40 days without direction and, and a checklist. 40 days without somebody saying, you know, you really shouldn't do that. You really should do this. How long would we last? When you feel like no one's watching, mm -hmm. can you, can God trust you? Can you trust you? Somebody once said that character is what you are when no one's looking. Right. Yep. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. Um, our, one, um, one of my friends in college would say, a lady is a lady in the presence of herself. I would say that same thing with Christianity. A true Christian is a Christian in the presence of himself. Mm -hmm. When nobody's looking and there's no accountability. And it's very possible that you could get away with it. Yep. Whatever it is, you could get away with it. Yep. So we see that the presence of God is powerful. And it's this all-consuming fire. And it is symbolized all the way through the shedding of blood. And let me tell you, I just about have my own little worship service whenever I, I see the connection between the blood that was shed on the cross and the blood and the sacrifice. Yeah. Because they couldn't walk away unnoticed. Yeah. You can't walk away from having blood sprinkled on you without everybody seeing that you're covered in blood. Right. And while that may sound gory, I hope that when people see me, they see the blood. Yes. Mm -hmm. I hope oh, yeah. that I make that sacrifice visible for them. Oh, yeah. And they know that it's not me, and it's nothing I can do, and it's no good thing that I can do. It's the presence of God. Yeah. That's right. We had a conversation this last Sunday night that was so awesome. We went um, to Muscle Shoals, and we, um, Pastor preached, did an incredible job. And afterwards, we went to a restaurant, and God had already cleared out the restaurant completely to where we were the only people there. <laughs> And the manager was so precious. I mean, he was absolutely precious. 
and um, they were ready to cook anything that we wanted. It was just, it was awesome and such a good time. And uh, he made the statement, he said, well, you know, I'm the same religion that Jesus was. And uh, it took a minute for us to catch that. And, and finally, somebody spoke up and said, oh, you're Jewish. And he was like, that's right, I am. I'm Jewish. And so he starts explaining some different things, and he starts talking about Christianity. And um, he said, uh, you know, most people don't know that Christianity goes back to Judaism. I'm like, I don't know who most people are, but <laughs> they don't have Bible study on Wednesday night, apparently. I don't, I don't know. And, um, and so I, I kind of just popped up a little bit, and I said, absolutely, Christianity goes back to Judaism. And, and that's, that's where the Shema comes in, which is, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And um, I said, you know, still one Lord. And, and that's, we kind of talked about that for a second. And I looked up, and his eyes were huge. And he's just like, he said, you know, you're the only Christian who has ever said the word Shema to me. He said, most Christians don't know anything about that. He said, most Christians don't really read the Old Testament. They can't tell me anything about that. And I was like, well, that's silly because that's our history. That's where we came from. You know, and so we started talking about that. And when we left, I told my husband, I said, as we were talking, I could feel the presence of God so strong because it was like it was drawing one of his children. Because you, he wasn't accidentally Jewish. God placed him in his background where he was. He placed him in that time, in that restaurant for such a time as that. Yeah. And he also had prepared me. Because during that service that night, we were praying. And, you know, sometimes God kind of gives you a little hint on what you need to pray for. And so we were praying in the service and we were worshiping, having an awesome time. God was moving. And I felt overwhelmed with the need to pray, God, take my knowledge into a step of anointing. The step that I've learned and I've studied, use it and anoint it. Yep. That's always my prayer. Why would I need to pray that in the middle of a service? That's weird. That service had nothing to do with anything I'd learned. But I prayed it anyway. And when we sat down at the restaurant that night, I knew exactly why I prayed that. Yeah. Because he did anoint. And as we were talking, I was able to bring things to memory that I haven't thought about in forever. And God used it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was praying, God, let him see you in me. That is not just knowledge. Let him see something. Let it be drawn by your spirit. And I believe he was. I really do. I want people to see that blood. I want them to see that sacrifice. Do we have any questions, thoughts, comments, Pastor? You got anything? Sure. Um, yeah. I'm talking about people not knowing or somebody making a comment saying that people don't know that Christianity has its roots in Judaism. I had a college professor who was a Episcopalian minister. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that you shed for us. Lord, I thank you for that covenant that you have opened for us, dear Jesus. God, I love you and I praise you, Lord, and I worship you, God. Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask that you will move in every life and every heart. Thank you, Lord. God, bless you, God. We worship you. And draw us all closer to you.